Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> this is June 10th, 2003 in Natick, Massachusetts. And this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates. Our cameraman is Robert Dunbar. And today we have with us Robert Pierce Duchy. What, can you tell us right off the bat, how did you get the nickname Duchy? Well, it's a little bit of a story, but it's uh, two years old, blonde hair, Dutch cut, and talked backwards. And they, my grandfather was, had the habit of giving nicknames to everybody, and they said I talked like a Dutchman. And my mother's name was Holzeiser, which is from Dutch German. So it stuck, it would just stuck with me. So ever after, you were Dutchy. So I was <clears> Dutchy. <throat> May I ask you where you were born? Taunton, Mass. And when were you born? In July 24th, 1913. And what is your current address? North Attleboro, Massachusetts. Marital status? Sir? Are you married? Yes, sir. And do you have children? I have two girls. Duchy, when and where did you enter the military? In 1943, um, around July, September rather, September I went in, in Attleboro. And when, at the time you entered, um, were you drafted or did you enlist or what? No, I was drafted. I had a high uh, draft number, see, but so it wasn't until um, 1943 that mine came up. And at the time you went into the service, you were married and had a, a baby daughter or two? One daughter. One. My daughter Lynn was born in, in um, June 19, I mean, June 4th, 14th. 1943. 1943. I think I have figured out that uh, next Saturday on Flag Day, she will be 60 years old. 60 years old, yes. Congratulations in your <laughs> family. <laughs> Where, would, where did you go when you were uh, in, entered to the military? Where did they send you first? Well, first they sent us to um, Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and we were processed there, and then we went by train south to um, Camp Wheeler in Georgia, near Macon, Georgia, and it was a, almost like a troop train, and went through all the cotton fields on the way down there, what did you do at Camp Wheeler? What kind of uh, training there? Well, it was basic infantry training. And the, su the surprise of the thing was, it was the same camp, my brother was there at the time, and he didn't know I was coming. And it was quite a surprise. And you spent uh, 17 weeks in basic, and then you're uh, sent to a, another camp at, at either Fort Devens or Camp Wheeler, did you take any battery of tests or something to see what the military, how they would use you? <clears throat> well, yes, um, you're interrogated um, and they give you uh, qualification numbers, like mine was, I think, 382, which meant office machine repair. And uh, when I got to uh, Camp Wheeler, they interrogate you again, and he said, well, you should um, get something out of this army. But it wasn't until um, I got to Italy that they decided I was better at repairing typewriters than shooting Germans. Can we go back a step? What was in your background before you went in the service that made you mechanically adept? At well, I worked for the Monroe Calculating Machine Company for five years from 1936 to 1941. And then I went from there to the LG Balfour Company as a salesman. So that when you got in the Army, somebody recognized this skill and said that perhaps sometime you might use it there. Is that correct? That's right, because this 382 uh, was like officer machine repair man. That was your spec number? Is that true? I think 382 was the number, yes. Yeah. And, um, but 
99% of the work in those shops is typewriters. But I also worked on calculating machines and adding listing machines. Where else did you go after Georgia? Did you go to other posts? Where did the Army send you from there? We went um, from uh, Camp Wheeler, because we had a furlough. They, we went by train back home for a week or so, and then we had to report to, um, uh, I think it was Patrick Henry. And um, That's in Virginia? Yes. Yeah. Um, there was another camp we were at briefly, but that's just like the staging areas to go overseas. I think I've got uh, on your record here that you were at Fort McClellan. Fort uh, McClellan. Prior to that. What yes. did you do at Fort McClellan? Practically nothing. I, we were only there 10 days, two, two weeks maybe at the most. You were waiting to go somewhere else. Yes. Yeah. And then at Patrick Henry, um, you're about to leave the United States of America, is that correct? Correct. Was, was there anybody else with you at the time that had uh, joined the Army with you, or were you generally all alone? Well, it seems that um, the Army uh, shifts you around every move you make. They have, I suppose, we're in a bunch of cars that's put through a machine, and so you're rarely with the same people and each move you make. In, you aren't in the convoy. There's some people in the convoy from, even from Attleboro, but they were in a different ship. When you went overseas then, uh, you were not, you were part of a unit or you were on assignment? No, you were, you were just a, a group of numbers. Yeah. And uh, then you get to the replacement depot, which was in Italy, and Okay. <clears throat> Before you sailed overseas, um, you were, you're trained to work in the infantry or serve in the infantry. Isn't that correct? I was trained for my basic training was infantry training. So when you went overseas, yes, you fully expected to go over as an infantry man. Oh, and yes. serve in the infantry. We were scheduled to go to Anzio or Casino. Did you have an opportunity to call your wife before you got on board the ship? Not from the replacement depot. Um, she visited with me at Port McClellan, but I don't believe uh, we had any contact other than that. Tell us about the trip over. I understand it was rather long. Well, we were in uh, Liberty ships. There's 500 uh, GIs cramped in below, and it took us uh, 21 days to go from Newport News, Virginia, to Gibraltar, and then it was seven days in the Mediterranean before we got to Brindisi, Italy. Did you stop at Gibraltar? No. You just sailed right through the straits there? We went through, um, well, I, I was trying to think, was it one time, it was during the daytime, we could see it. When we left there, coming back, we didn't see that. What about going over? Uh, how large was your convoy, and did you see any action? I would estimate, through a upwards of 85 ships. There were five or six tiers from front to back and then as far as you could see either side. Were, um, at any time was there a, a submarine scare or did you see any German planes? Going One time on? after we uh, went past Gibraltar we stopped uh, the whole convoy stopped, all the ships that were, were going. Well, a lot of the ships that uh, were with us to start with right, branched off and went to England before Gibraltar. And then just a few of us went through Mediterranean into Italy. And um, during the day, we, they stopped and fired the uh, anti-aircraft guns, or the 50 caliber guns, uh, just to try them out. Because the day before, not the day before, but sometime during that day, I guess, we saw this one 
plane fly over, which apparently was German, and so they knew we were there. And we headed on from there, and we went down to uh, Sicily, pulled into the harbor, I think it was not Georgia, just for uh, two or three hours, and then we left and went around the boot of Italy, and at that time, we heard this tremendous crash against the sides of the ship, which was depth charge, because the uh, British convoy ships, which are real fast, had dropped a depth charge. They had the sounding, supposedly, of a uh, submarine, but that's all that came of it. When you were on, when you went around to the east shore of Italy, yes. Did you know where you were going, or did you feel you were on your way to North Africa? Did, did, you, did you folks have no, any I, idea what your destination was? Oh, uh, at that point, yes, we knew that we were going to Italy, because we went around the boot to Brindisi, and that's where we disembarked, if that's the word, and they piled us in the 40 and 8 freight cars, which the name came from infamous uh, World War I. Train cars, yeah. And from there we went up to uh, the area of the Repel Depot. On board your ship, um, I think your notes have told us that there were 250 American Nisis, Japanese yes. Americans. Tell us about your, your relationship with them or meeting these people. It was quite unique. Um, in the hold of the ship, they had these um, bunks that went five and six tiers high. And on one side of the ship were these uh, Japanese Americans, and on the other side were the Americans. And uh, of course, the most activity on board ship is shooting craps which the Japanese Americans loved. And one, one um, GI had a, a roll of bills, must be eight inches in diameter, hanging from a leather thong on his bunk. And he was the, he was the bank ruler for all the other young GIs. And no one ever touched it. Why not? Well, I suppose it's in theater. <laughs> it seems that would be a very tempting thing on a uh, shipboard. Well, I, I can't tell you why not, except that they, they only they, they never, as far as my knowledge is, that nothing was ever touched. May I ask you, long after the fact now, did you take part in this gambling? Sir? Did you take part in these gambling no, games? No, I didn't, because I wasn't a gambler. and. Uh, I could have, because well, the Americans or the, the Japanese Americans, they just like one. They roll the dice and you throw your dollars in or not. You told us also that uh, there was singing on board. Yes. Um, one of the uh, fellows that uh, had been with me even since basic training, not in the same company, but he was. Um, I wish I could think of the school in Massachusetts. He was in the music department. And uh, so he and I and two other of the GIs that we had known each other you know, through the whole process got together and uh, he, we had this one song by Paul, Paul, uh, Cole Porter. Um, and he did, we didn't have any instruments, but he hit the chord and we did a harmony of the uh, song, uh, uh, I can't think of the name of it right now, but uh, it was just part of the entertainment. Other GIs did things like on, on deck on the way over. It, and after three weeks you finally got off the ship and you took a train to, uh, what, was the, what was the town you went to? I don't remember remember the name of the town, um, it was the uh, replacement depot, which they call the Ruppel Depot. It was Count Ciano's dairy farm. Count Ciano was Mussolini's son-in-law. Son yes. And it, it was 
covered the whole valley. The whole valley was covered with these army tents, and it seemed like there should have been 15,000 of them. There were so many. But that was one of the staging areas for the Italian complex. And the majority of us were expected to go to either Anzio or Casino, which was real hot at the time. And uh, they discovered in, in interviews that the, uh, uh, where I, the station, the company I was in, that uh, I'd be more, more valuable in repairing type artists and shooting Germans. Because they had, in, in Naples, they had a shop and they had uh, seven or eight Italian boys working on the typewriters besides three or four GIs. And the uh, Italian boys were on strike for more money. And uh, so they had put in a call to the Repel Depot for some typewriter repairmen. And I was one of them and another fellow that went down there for me. He was from California. We both went down as uh, office equipment repairmen. This is the turning point in the war for you, is because yes. the the rest of the men you sailed over with went on to other billets. Tell us about how did you hear about this call that they're looking for typewriter men? This is like they're calling you personally. You're well, a typewriter repair man. I. Uh, some of us were just roaming around. We had idle time, and we went into the. Uh, it was a. a, a a farm building where normally they'd have cattle, but there were none there. And in one of the stalls was this GI, uh, there were two of them, I think, that were working on typewriters, and I started to question them about it. And they told me at the time that um, they were needing typewriter men down in, in, in Naples. So when I got back to my company, I went up to the captain of our company and, and spoke to him and said, told him that uh, what I had done and that I had a, uh, a number, I think it was 382, which is qualification for, for um, office machine repair. And that, that they were uh, looking for a man down in Naples. Well, they undoubtedly had not gotten to the request because he wasn't quite sure of it. And uh, so they undoubtedly shuffled the cards around and, and my name came up and another boy, Glenn Campbell from California, came up and, uh, and he said, Do you, can you uh, fix typewriters? I said, oh yes, although more of my experience had been with calculating machines and, and adding listing machines. And so we made a pilot on a three-quarter ton truck and drove down maybe 20, 25 miles to Naples and uh, dumped us off in this it looked like a, an apple orchard and uh, with our duffel bags. And we just went in and then within the, the, the uh, orchard were these tents and that was the company I was transferred to. So you were, you joined now a new company. You didn't commute back up to the uh, depot every day. No. You were no, now we were, down in Naples? We were permanently assigned it was a 219th SNR, which is Salvage and Repair Quartermaster. Uh, see, the Army didn't have it worked out too effectively, efficiently for this particular job. And uh, we sometimes thought we were supposed to have been with the ordnance, but they put us with the Salvage Repair, and they didn't have any, uh, it was just for housing, because they took us down to Naples, which was eight or 10 miles each morning, and it picked us up at five o'clock each day, except Sundays we had off. Can I give you a quote about a Monroe calculating machine? This is some, somebody said this to you. This machine is worth a shipload of ammunition. What is that all about? The, the sergeant from a company the, um, in Naples, uh, the, uh, I can't think of the name of the company, but they made up the, the roster uh, the manifest for the invasion of southern France. This is what was going on at the time. And he brought in this Marchant calculating machine, which I'd never seen or, or never worked on actually, 
but I had worked on Monroe Calgary machines many, many times. So it was unfamiliar to me in a sense because I had to repair the dials in the machine. Two of the dials weren't working. So I had to take it apart, which took me at least two days because I was not familiar how you undo a machine sometimes. And I had to eventually end up tying it together with cord and then take it apart piece by piece because when I first started, the little springs would run away and the, the um, little um, BB type of, on the other end, you know, which locates the, the dial. And I had to get on the floor and find them because you do things very cautiously uh, till you know, you know what you're doing. So finally I got it apart and I got the dial off. There was just really one, I think, and there were a couple of the teeth broken. So we had to take and spot weld some steel and there was really no way to harden it. And then I had to file the teeth of the tooth and there were two or three of them, I've forgotten exactly, on one or two dials. Uh, then I had to get it, put it back together again, which was simpler than trying to get it out, actually. And each day, someone from the company the, the, uh, um, that was making up the manifest for the invasion would come in. Like the sergeant brought it in, and then like a, a captain came in, wanted to know if it's ready like two days later. It wasn't. And I had three different offices. Finally, there was possibly a major came in. And we'd gone four or five, six days at this point. And um, <laughs> that's our fire department going by. And when the, uh, the I think it was a major came in, he says, you know, that machine is worth a boatload of ammunition to the invasion. So I felt kind of good about it. So it was finally repaired and they picked it up. And uh, I think I mentioned in my story that I wasn't sure whether those teeth that we put into the gear lasted or how long it lasted, but at least we won the war. Can we look at this from another side that uh, we're talking about a a day and age when the war was run not with computers but from with calculating machines and adding machines yes. and if they broke down as you point out the war stopped in essence yes they have to they have to do with what they have and uh, if they can get uh, replacements fine but in most cases it's very difficult we didn't have parts for most things and we had to cannibalize typewriters in order to repair some. And that's common practice in that. Because the, um, the, uh, the depot, like two and four, which distributes this uh, equipment to the different companies, different outfits. Um, if they have it, fine. But see, we couldn't get parts at all. We cannibalized. And then I did a lot on portable typewriters. And we had what was the bend and break process. You bend it to adjust, and sometimes you bend it too far and it broke. But uh, that was the minimums. Can you take a minute to tell us about your working conditions? Were you out in tents or in a stable, or was it light enough? Did you have enough room? In, in Naples, we went right downtown Naples, and it was located right near the um, Naples post office, which was bombed by the Americans off and on. And they had a huge Red Cross there, which we used to go to uh, like at noontime for lunch. Or there was another, <coughs> um, uh, I'm trying to say county town. There was a, a university there that we went for lunch, which is another company. But then all GIs could go there and working in Naples. But we had a, a building. Um, it was down fairly near the wharf, and uh, we had four or five, well, end up with about seven GIs and four or five Italian civilians. And uh, sometimes we would 
run into a problem and I'd speak to one of the Italians and I'd just talk to him in English and, and gesture and uh, he'd talk to me in Italian and he'd gesture and I'd know what he's talking about, he'd you know what I'm talking about to solve the problem. The ironical thing, when the first day I went there, I told the uh, sergeant in, ch in charge of the shop that I worked for Monroe Calculating Machine Company and he had brought out this listing machine, an adding machine, which was a Monroe. It's the only one I saw in the, in the, um, in the uh, all my time over there. Um, matter of fact, that Marchant was the only calculating machine I'd seen. But I repaired that, uh, although I hadn't done an awful lot of work on it, but I got it working. Would you, for us, um, historically, Italy at one time was the enemy of the United States. It was part of the Axis. Right. Um, when you were there working in Naples, what was the relationship with the Italians? It was nothing unusual. We, we weren't um, mixed up with the Italians very much. Um, I know at one time they had a dance and uh, there was an American GI orchestra and uh, but they're all Italian girls and, and GIs we only went there um, just one time actually because we couldn't converse with the girls <laughs> that most of them didn't speak because they know some English it's a quite a common language in the larger view Dutchie can you describe Naples wartime Naples for us uh, was it blacked out at night? Were there raids? Um, what? Where was Mark Clark in the Fifth well, I'm, Army? I'm sure it was blacked out, but see, we were about ten miles away from there. Yeah. In our little old orchard, in a individual, not I mean our, our tents with about two, four, six, about eight men in each tent with double decker bunks, and it was uh, quite a change from the Rappel Depot to there, because in the Rappel Depot you had one tent with about eight cots and a lot of mud, which was about five and six inches deep. And eventually, the shoes I had on, the soles fell off. But in, in, uh, in Naples, or outside of Naples, we had uh, electric lights and uh, our own bunk and a place to put our toilet articles. And of course, we had uh, uh, our own mess and everything. But each day, we went down to Naples and one thing, when the day before I left the Rappel Depot, at about 10 o'clock at night, they called Bed Check Charlie came over, and the Germans came over and bombed usually Naples. And uh, this one, the day before we moved, because the alarms went off and we get out into a, a slit trenches, and it was just pitched black, and they dropped chandelier, candelier uh, lights candelier. It lit up, it was so bright that we could take a letter out of a park and read it. It was just about 20, 25 miles away, close to that. But that particular night, this uh, bomber had come in, he flew right over where we were going, because there was an engineering outfit there, and dropped a bomb about 200 yards past where our outfit was. And um, to my recollection, they never came back, because uh, they didn't have much success, and um, but they would bomb. Um, well, the Germans, uh, the, the Americans would bomb in that area, but the Germans were still. From your vantage point there, and that's a very dramatic story of being in a slit trench and being bombed. What about the the war as it was moving north up up the Italian boot, as it were? Uh, was it the Siegfried line that uh, was it what the the Germans had a line across northern Italy there? Yes. What did you see about the movement of troops and perhaps well, combat results? We didn't see any of that at all. Uh, we were too far back. But Anzio, well, Casino was just north of us. Then north of that was Anzio, which we were uh, the GI's uh, infantry people that we were trained with. We were supposed to have gone there, but we were 
unfortunately, we were changed to a quartermaster. But um, other than that, it was just a, a large city with a lot of traffic and GIs around. And of course, civilian-wise, I can't think too much about it, actually. How did you get the news of what was happening at the Monte Cassino and Anzio? Well, what, the only... What word did you get that filtered well, back Well, Stars to you? and Stripes newspaper mm -hmm. was published. And um, other than that, uh, word of mouth, we talked to people at the, at the um, Red Cross. They had a huge, a very huge building of the Red Cross. They would go there at least once a day, like at noontime. Sometimes we'd go further up to the university for a regular meal. But uh, you didn't follow the war, per se, except I don't remember too much about the newspaper, to tell you the truth, but it was, it was published in uh, whatever it was in the uh, Stars and Stripes. Can you tell us where you were on D-Day, the uh, invasion of Normandy? Um, Not specifically, but were you still? Well, I was, uh, in, I was in Naples. I mean, I don't know just exactly. And uh, how long after D-Day did you move out? I am assuming you well, followed we went, the troops south, uh, north. We went in a, a small convoy into um, southern France, which is D plus 14, D plus 14 for southern France. Um, and because at that time, uh, these troop ships, and I can't recall how many men were on each ship, we uh, uh, disembarked from the ship on these uh, Higgins landing boats. They came down and they went up onto the, the sand be sandy beach, which had the corrugated um, steel mesh for them to get up on so they don't sink in the sand. And we just walked off into, um, there was no no, uh, nothing like the, the invasion of France on, on the north. And we just marched in. Um, we were uh, two platoons. There were three platoons altogether, but we were two platoons. And we marched into um, our near town, Monescu, and we uh, pitched our little pub tents in this big field for overnight. And then we moved further up the next day where the, uh, I can't recall the, recall the name of the town, but there was a large gymnasium which we uh, went to and we stayed there for a couple of days. And we, uh, in order to move, we had to hitchhike, so to speak. We had trailers, shoe trailers, uh, tailor trailers, and then one for repairing carts and tents. And there was a trailer in itself, but we only had one um, donkey, you know, one to a tractor. And we had to borrow tractors to move the other two. And we get a ride with this trucking company, all the GIs, we just pile on it. And they took us up to, um, I think it was Ulm. And of uh, course the trailers would follow us later. And of course this is how you go. You you sort of leapfrog. We were supposed to be with the Seventh Army rear, and at the time of the bulge, we were ahead of Seventh Army forward, which meant we were we were headed toward the um, was a bastone, and at night we could hear these uh, um, tanks rolling. They were to the right of us, 10, 20 miles, I don't know what. It was the 45th Division was moving up. And uh, <clears throat> I could hear them. So as the line moved forward, we moved forward. And uh, we were in, I can't even remember the name of the town, but we were in, in a churchyard. We were ahead, ahead of 7th Army forward, which we were not supposed to be at the time, but. We were bullfrogging, and um, in this large churchyard, we had 
I think, two trailers with us at the time. And of course, we had moved our typewriter shop up there. And uh, then the Battle of the Bulge came, and because we, we went up on Thanksgiving and we retreated on Christmas because of, of the factor. And then we went way back, I think that's when we went back to Ulm. During all this time that you've mentioned, getting off the Higgins boat and making your way north, was this as an infantryman, or were you still repairing typewriters and, and doing that kind of work? Oh, yes. We were, we were the 219th S&R, which is a salvage and repair company. You see, there were outfits that, that picked up salvage from the battlefields, etc. Guns and tents and cots and, and um, office equipment. And they'd go back to repair a, a, an outfit like us. And some would go to a laundry to be washed, to be cleaned. And then it would go to a two and four, which is a distribution um, outfit. Did you work on anything besides typewriters? You mentioned other equipment. Did you repair armaments or anything like that? It was 99% no. almost typewriters and, and I, uh, some calculating machines. Um, there were some German machines that we had to work on, typewriter machines. And what, what kind of working conditions? Where did you, every night, where did you set up shop? Well, as we traveled along, um, uh, there were one or two times we had to set up a tent. I think I have a picture of, of one in a tent, man, it was in the window because we had some snow. But it's usually um, an office in a factory that's not been run. One, one in particular in France, um, we, well, a good many of us put our cots up in the, their office, and in the morning there would seem, be some women come in to go to work in the, in the uh, factory. I don't know just what it was, about some small area. And uh, they would see us just getting out of our bunks to go to work. We had buildings most of the time to, to go into. You spoke a moment ago about being very proximate to uh, Bastogne. Um, and that was one of the worst winters in Europe in history. Tell us about your life uh, under those circumstances and well, in, where in you were. Well, in that part of France, were... we, we had little, very little snow, but there was in one place that I just mentioned about where we were, we were set up our cots in the office, we must have had a, maybe a foot of snow, but it wasn't uh, all the time. Matter of fact, we set up a uh, shop north of there one time, and we had we were had living quarters. We we're in a camouflage camouflage uh, hospital that had the trees and shrub growing on the top. You get a little bit away, you couldn't even see it. But that was just for living quarters. Something in your notes describes being uh, near a hospital with German uh, prisoner of war um, and hidden pistols. Can you tell us about that? Well, that's the place we were living in the, um, <clears throat> this building had the camouflage on the top. There were half a dozen or 10 German PWs that were able to fix typewriters and they were working with us. Uh, it was myself and uh, uh, one other GI that was from the uh, 219th had been uh, sent up north of our regular outfit. And uh, I've forgotten the circumstances, but we were north of them in the, in the, toward the Black Forest, I believe it was. And we had these German PWs uh, working for us. There was one about a six foot, five or six, 16 year old boy that spoke English because he was my interpreter. And uh, we just had the machines, they fixed them, and that was it. But that only lasted uh, two or three weeks for me, because I was called back. They wanted to send me to R&R. &R. So that war was, the war was over at the time. What about these p uh, hidden pistols? Sir? 
I, I think I got from your notes that there was something about hidden pistols were involved in uh, that. Pistols? Yes, sir. Well, when we were in Bavaria, um, it was the site, and the name leaves me now, it was the site of the, um, one of the Olympics. I think it was a 1936 Olympics, I'm not sure. And it was an area hospital, I mean, an area of German um, hospital for amputees and the like, because this is after the, the shooting had stopped. And um, they discovered in some of the shrubs around the hospital, some of the GIs nosing around dug up pistols because they were left there. So that if someone could escape from the hospital, they'd have some, some uh, pistols, whatever you want to use them for, I'd say. I know they, the lake right nearby where they had the uh, Olympic uh, ice skating, and there was a, um, the uh, bobsled run, which is all dry. First, we walked up and down it at one time. Uh, I have a, a picture, I think you have a picture of the crew sitting outside at a break. This is after the war. Now, the war is over. Yes. Where were you when the war ended? Sir? Where were you when the war ended? Were you in Bavaria? Uh, yes. Um, I'm thinking it was Ulm. Because uh, shortly after that, uh, they started to send us back up to uh, Ludwigshaven, Mannheim and Ludwigshaven which was um, a German concern. Uh, it was like a German military academy at one time. And these uh, three-decker concrete uh, brick buildings, you know. And uh, there were other outfits there, the uh, distribution outfits there. And we set up a shop. And just outside, they had oh, hundreds of these small biplanes, uh, re recon planes that the, G the army, our army used, because they, they were just excess right now. You went in the service in 43, now it's 45. 43 to 45. And you must have gotten quite a number of points because you were overseas quite a while. That's right. Um, but I interrupted you a minute ago. You got an R and R, and I get you got to see both London and Paris. Is that correct? Yes, I was I was in the uh, north of um, a regular outfit, and they called me back to uh, for R and R, and I was supposed to go to Riviera, but I was a couple of days late in getting back, so I had to wait a few more days till another um, allotment came to go to England. And um, we took the train to the uh, the coast, um, the, the, the uh, English Channel, and so we had to find quarters to stay overnight. There were a half a dozen GIs and one officer, and uh, so the next morning. Um, there's something about a flight that we were supposed to take. Uh, oh, that's right. Originally, we were supposed to take a flight, but it wasn't available somehow. So we took a train up to the coast, and then we took a, uh, a British, I'm going to say lorry, but it wasn't a lorry, just a small powered boat across the channel to England. And then we took the train from there into. And what did London. you do in London? Sir? What did you do in London during this time? <laughs> well, um, you're more or less on your own. And uh, I happened to meet one boy who was from Attleboro. And uh, we went to uh, out of town on the bus to, uh, there was a dog track there. And we got there too late. So we went to one of the pubs. And uh, this was filled with British GIs, because they didn't think a lot about American GIs because they were dating their girls and what have you, but um, overpaid, oversexed, and over here, sir. 
overpaid, oversexed, and over <laughs> here. But one of the highlights, uh, there was a, a large hotel near where I was uh, living in a Red Cross outfit, a small building that they took over. And uh, I'd go over there at five o'clock and they would serve hard liquor. And this, this um, lounge could have had 50 to 100 people in it at five o'clock and then they serve you until the liquor runs out, which means the, the waitress came by and, and I said, I have a scotch and water, she'd bring two, and then next time she said, do you want double? So I ended up with four or five scotch and water sitting in front of me, and right beside me was this elderly dowager woman with a cane or two and rings all over her fingers, knee to knee, and we just jammed in there. And it was the, the first hard liquor I'd had in two years, I guess. But it was, it was enjoyable. And after that, of course, you could get on the subway and go to um, uh, Piccadilly Circus, and they had a Red Cross that was a noted Red Cross uh, with a lot of um, oh, stars and stuff would go there. And uh, you could go to a hotel there, and if you might catch you, might just get another scotch and soda, a scotch and water. <laughs> but that was um, the highlight as far as I'm concerned. Uh, other than that, of course, I went to uh, Windsor Castle and uh, to the, um, well, I can't think of the names of the places, uh, historic places in, uh, in London. I went uh, one, it must have been over a Sunday because I went to one of the, uh, I would say Episcopal, which I am Episcopal, the Church of England service, which was enjoyable. How did you get back to your outfit? Sir? How did you get back to your outfit? Well, you had, I think, something like a seven-day pass. Well, when it got to the end of my seven days, um, I went down to the airport to sign up to leave. Well, if the, uh, the uh, planes are full, they just stamp it, and you come back the next day. And that happened two or three days in a row, and then I learned from a, a young fellow that was in our company on, on leave by himself. He said that they, um, your comp they're sending them back to the States. So I said, I better get down to the airport. So I went down there very, very early in the morning, and I was fortunate in that respect to get a flight uh, back into Germany. Were you on your way home now? Uh, were they I was back to my company near Mannheim, and uh, then from there, uh, these orders come to cer send certain people back to the States. And uh, there were oh, six or eight of us together, and uh, one of our stops, that we, we headed south uh, by train, we were in Göppingen, which was a um, nice little town. They, they made toys, men, in particular toy trains. And we were attached to the um, 36th um, Division at that time, because they attached you to somebody to move you. And we stayed there for several days. I worked as a uh, jeep driver for a captain of one of the outfits there. And a friend of mine, he uh, did something else. I've forgotten just what it was now. But we had, uh, we had um, our own mess, that is, you know, the, th the division's mess. And because they were scattered all over the place, but I don't remember the, the uh, particular regiment. But, uh, the, the captain that I was with, he, he said he could um, fix me up with, to go back with his regiment. But I said, no, I'm not volunteering right ahead. for anything more. So I just went back 
I was thinking it was on a um, Thanksgiving time. They load you on these 40 and 8 freight cars, and you just go. And they stopped at one point. Uh, that, say this was Thanksgiving, and was, they had these huge tents set up, and everyone in the the train would get out, and you had your turkey dinner, which at the time was canned turkey plus whatever it was. And then we went right down to the coast. Uh, I wish I could tell you the name of the, of the, um, but we went down to a staging area on the uh, southern coast of France, and you're with a, a different outfits each time. You, they shuffle the cards around, so you're not, you're rarely with the same people at all. And, uh, and then from there, they loaded our group onto the USS Admiral Caps, which was a, something like 5,000 troops in it. It was a turb, turb, turbo, 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 turbo electric double screw transport. And it was in the Army. And um, where it took us 21 days coming over to Gibraltar, exactly almost 27 to Brindisi, it took us, I think, maybe eight or 10 days to go back. That's a fast ship, yeah. Yeah. Where did you come back to? Um, where did you land New, back Newport in this? Newport News. Uh, in Virginia, area. yeah. And then um, you're on your way to being discharged? That's right. Yeah. Where did where did that happen? Um, I'm trying to think exactly. Um, I don't think that was Patrick Henry again. Because uh, we ended up at at Devon's. Right where you started. <laughs> Sir. That's just about where you started, isn't That's it? That's right. That's right, yeah. So you must have... Where was your wife and family at this time? They're in Massachusetts. And did you get on a bus or train and come home? Well, we, we, had, to, we had to go to Fort Devens first. We were shipped to Fort Devens and they process you. And uh, every place you go, they shake you down for contraband. And uh, like if you, I had a, a officer's musette bag, you know, that I'd picked up when I was uh, in Germany, you know, carrying cosmetics and stuff. And it's not allowed, so you have to throw it out. You're supposed to have two blankets, and I had three. I made into a bedroll at one stopover, and uh, they shake it down, and I had to get rid of one of the blankets. But uh, there was no, no sweat. Tell us about walking up to your house with your worldly belongings and seeing your wife and family again. Well, um, when, I, uh, when I left, because uh, uh, she came up to uh, Camp Devins with um, friends, and I saw her then, and then at, at uh, Fort McClellan, um, she was there uh, when we were shipping out, before we shipped out, for about like an overnight, that's about the size of it. But other than that, um, I left Devons uh, by train and down to Attleboro, and I put the, my, uh, belongings in a <laughs> duffel bag, I couldn't even think of the name of it, over my shoulder and walked from the station, which is, you know, a quarter of a mile at the most, maybe, to the um, house where my wife was, and, and my daughter Lynn was there, and uh, knocked on the door and went in upstairs, and my daughter Lynn was two, two and a half, she stared at this man, all dressed in a heavy overcoat, 
I, mm. I didn't have a beard or anything, and an overseas cap on. And it was strange, I was strange to her. So I, you know, said hi and did all that. And I sat down in a chair and we were chatting. And finally, she's standing with her mother. And finally, she came over and sat down beside me. And we were friends again. You were home. Can you tell us, after your long experience in the service? Now what? The long time you were away from yes. home and in the service, how important to you was serving in the, in the United States military? Uh, I don't understand what you're saying. After looking back 60 yes. some years or so yes. at your, what you did in the service yes. and your ser uh, years of service, how important was being in the military to you? What did it mean to me? Yes, sir. Well, I was in the service a total of 28 months, and because uh, you're doing, serving your obligations to, for the uh, good of the country that was a war on, and that was it. They, uh, they train you all through it. Um, they prepare you for the next step. And uh, if you're smart, you accept it, because a lot of them don't. They fight it, and what happens, they never know. But it's just something you had to do, and you accept it for what it is and, and try to enjoy it. In the time you were in the service, is there a particular incident, a memorable experience that comes to you every once in a while that you could tell us about? Well, I have, um, <laughs> at this stage of my life, I have a sort of a short-term memory loss, but I, I still have a vivid recall for things in the past, even today. And uh, I just try to enjoy myself, because I've dealt with people all my life in business, and uh, <clears throat> I enjoy people, and I make the most of it. And uh, I know it's just my nature, I suppose. Is there one particular person, some character that you remember from your time in the service? Well, just ordinary people, actually, because I dealt with them. Matter of fact, I, I gave Lynn a picture that has five or six of us in our work clothes in this area. And I can give you the names of practically all of them right now. <clears throat> and uh, but as far as characters, um, nothing comes to me right now. Actually, it's just every day. Well, it, was, it was an everyday work day, actually, and uh, you had the people around you, and you enjoyed them, and you did various things. Matter of fact. This uh, friend, Glenn Campbell, and I, we hitchhiked from um, near Naples to Rome. This was after the war was over. And uh, we had a, I've forgotten now whether it was, it must have been just a day pass, I guess, because you just hitchhike and, because we, we uh, got in these, because they pick you up, all, all military trucks and stuff. And, uh, and most of them were traveling to Rome. And we got into Rome and we walked through it almost to the um, um, I can't think of the name of the, the uh, what's the Catholic, uh, but the Pope is. The Vatican. Vatican, yes, almost to there. And then we just turned around and walked back and then started hitchhiking back again. And since we got back, I don't remember what time, it may have been at night. Oh, I'm sure it was. But there was very little restrictions that was being after the war. But I don't recall any specific characters um, other than just ordinary people and circumstances to do with the, with the military. We've been uh talking here for just about an hour. 
And before we close, I'd like to ask you, is, is there anything I haven't asked you that you would like to tell us about today? Some memory or uh, some part of your service that you would like to include as part of this tape? Well, I can't. Uh, this is where my short-term memory comes in. <laughs> and uh, it, it's strange. Like, I don't read a lot, and, and uh, I never was a, a good student, uh, particularly. But um, I'll read a story, and after I'm halfway through a chapter, I have to keep going back to put the stuff together because I don't, so consequently, uh, I don't read as much as maybe I, I should even. But I can't think of anything right offhand, actually. Uh, you've asked me uh, pointed questions to just about the main things, about just a lot of little things, that's about all. And, because uh, see, we went from Naples to southern France, and then up along following the Seventh Army, and then Chris then afterwards going to, uh, to London, which is uh, you know, interesting to do. But um, Chris then the, the, <laughs> the journey back from uh, southern France on this uh, USS Admiral Capps, it was like one big crap game going on. On the decks, there were GIs. If you had a blanket and a set of dice, you can make yourself, if you're unlucky, you can make a living going back from France to Germany. And of course, there were hundreds of them, I mean, all over the place. And I didn't indulge. It wasn't that interesting to me, actually. But I met a, a boy, a sailor on the, uh, the U.S. Admiral Capps, who was from Attleboro. He found my name on a roster, and of course, the ship is about 10 floors down trucks and everything else. And uh, he located me, and, and I can't remember his name. I never did look him up afterwards. And uh, he said, uh, if you want to get so only really one meal a day, I can have another, me uh, another meal if I take this job. And I didn't. It was something you didn't have to do. I said, no, I don't vol volunteer for anything at this stage. <laughs> That's right. So it was no big deal. But it was interesting to meet him there, actually. In which case, thank you very much for coming in today. Well, thank you. It's Appreciate interesting it. talking with you.